Well, I think, I, yeah, I think the, probably two, you'll see two effects happen. One is that it'll continue to, f to fill in here as well to, a, to an extent. Um, you still have a certain amount of water moving down the river that has to get to the lake somehow. So there's always going to be a channel there to move that water. But, you know, it could be that it becomes less and less of a channel all the time because you've got so much delta sediment around it, and maybe it just becomes deeper and narrower. You know, that's one possibility. But the other thing for certain that, that's going to happen as that sediment keeps getting deposited from the, the mouth of the Niobrara downstream is that the riverbed is going to continue to rise. And as that riverbed continues to rise, um, flooding problems, high water table problems will just get worse. I think the first thing that should be done, that can be done actually quickly, is to, again, look at sediment management within the watersheds. Because that actually, that actually buys you time. It, it cuts down on the source of the problem itself. Instead of you know, letting all of this erosion come into the river systems, we know where it ends up very quickly. Let's do what we can to try to minimize, first of all, the amount of sediment getting in there. You're never going to stop it. I mean, there are certain things that go on that really aren't that related to land use that much, like erosion of a riverbed or erosion of the banks. That's still going to happen. But there are ways that we can, we can cut down on the amount of sediment that's entering the, the tributary streams, which then cuts down on the amount coming into the delta. That, I think that's something that should be done quickly, to look at where else besides the Lewis and Clark watershed can those types of things be done. But then secondly, and more toward the long term, um, I think first of all you have to decide, do you want to just stop the sedimentation where it's at, or do you want to actually reverse it and back it up? And I think that sort of, sort of then determines what you would do a, as a, a means to get rid of the sediment. Um, you know, the, the flushing thing that the core is talking about, you know, that, that's designed, I think, more to, to remove as much of it as possible. Uh, a more mechanical means like dredging and so on, that you can gear it toward whatever you want to do. If you want to dredge, enough, dredge it so much that you're reducing what's there, that's one thing. If you want to dredge it uh, to the extent that you're just keeping up with what's coming in, if you combine that with lessening what's coming in, then maybe all of a sudden it becomes economically more feasible to do. So I think you really have to, first you have to define is it a problem where it is right now and you want to reduce that or do you just want to st stop it from getting worse and then you can decide which one of these physical means that you start to look at. You mean, you mean when they stop hydropower production? I'm not sure. I, I, I really don't know. Um, my, my guess is that there's probably still going to be flushing that has to go on. I don't know that, that they plan to just open the gates and leave them open, but I'm not an expert on what's going on or what the plans are for the Spencer Dam. Uh, I don't know what's gonna be, when it's going to be finished. Finished. Um, you know, they've been coming out with reports in parts and. Um, I don't, I don't know of any particular end date. I know that they're, they're rerunning. You know, they did an initial model to look at the, the flushing component of it. And that model showed that basically what you were going to move through Gavin's Point Dam was clays and silts and not the sands. And the sands would really just be pushed further into the lake. So that wasn't good. So they're sort of retooling the way that all gets done, looking at other alternatives for flushing. And they're rerunning models on that. that and so that's, um, you know, a study that we're waiting to see the results of. Um, I, but I really don't know when it's going to be done done or if anybody even knows that. Well, so if they, if they do flush it, uh, it has to be done carefully. And this is one of the things that throws a wrench in it, I, I think, is that you can't just put this whole slug of sediment through the dam in, in a few weeks or a couple of months because there's no way that the river downstream can handle that. So it has to be governed a little bit so that you're, you're putting it in, in in certain quantities at a time so the river still has time to carry it away. Now, in the river between, say, um, Yankton and Sioux City, I think there'd be a lot of benefits to it because 
the river has, has been hurt by not having that sediment, by cutting way down into its riverbed. And if you ever go look at the river down there, you'll see these really, really high cut banks. They're like 20, 25 feet high. And that also then leads to a lot of bank erosion. So if, if some of that sediment goes back in there and allows the riverbed to build itself back up a little bit, that would actually be good for, the, for that river. The other thing is that um, sandbar, natural sandbars, are good for that stretch of the river too, for a lot of the, a lot of the species that live there. And that never gets done except in big floods. So there were some sandbars that were built in 1997. There was a lot of sandbars that were built in 2011, but at least half of those sandbars are gone now five years later. And when it may get to the point again where the core is back out there with track hose and bulldozers pushing up sand off the riverbed to rebuild sandbars. And that's, that's expensive and it's really not the best way to do that. So putting that sediment back in would help the river build those things naturally. Now, what does it do when you get down into the, navi the navigation channel? So first of all, not all of the sediment is going to make it all the way to St. Louis. A lot of it settles out at various parts in the river. Yeah. Obviously, they don't want it to settle out in the navigation channel. I don't know that anybody knows just how, you know, how that would change things, but they've designed the navigation channel to be a self-scouring channel. So theoretically, what's coming in and trying to settle out as sediment gets scoured because of the strength of the current. It's concentrated into you know, basically such a small area that it tends to scour whatever tries to settle in it. You may have more sediment build up uh, outside of the channel, still in the river, but outside of the channel. But I think the, the channel is engineered to keep itself clean. Whether or not it can handle this amount of sediment, I don't know, though. But that's obviously something that the Corps will be paying close attention to as they not, not only model the flush out of the reservoir, I'm sure they're going to be modeling what happens to that sediment as it goes downstream. Well, so that, that's the problem. And the, the, the thing that they have to be careful about is that, that they don't reach those types of flows again. And so that's one of the things that, for my understanding, the, the new model they're looking at is being able to flush it with lower flows but over a longer period of time to, to minimize any type of flooding that would happen downstream. Because if any of these solutions comes in and says, you know, miles downstream, they're going to see flooding again, it's just going to kill it right away. So they have to come up with a solution where they're not going to do any type of major flooding downstream. So what the, the way they're looking at doing that is there's several things going on. But one would be, first of all, to, again, put these outlets in the lower part of the dam. And that's actually a very expensive thing to do. But you know, Gavin's Point doesn't have lower outlet tunnels, and it would need something like that so that you, the sediment at the bottom of the riverbed can move through. So that's the first thing that has to happen. The other thing is Lewis and Clark Lake gets drawn down to basically a river again, um, and that has problems because, you know, then you're, you're hurting the recreation and fisheries value of the lake when you do that. But if you can figure out a way to do that and not hurt it, and some of the things that they've looked at is maybe like, cutting the lake in half where forcing all the flow to go down one side of the lake and that way you maintain enough current in the lake to keep the, the uh, sediment in suspension so it won't settle out in the lake but it'll make it all the way through the dam and they wouldn't have to draw the lake down this far that way then. Um, so that's being looked at and then of course um, one thing that would be very different then that wasn't here in 2011 is all the vegetation would be removed from the existing delta. So that's one of the things that's holding all the sediment there is the vegetation, like these Phragmites and everything else. So that would all have to be killed and removed mechanically before you would flush the sediment. So you've got, now you've got loose sediment that will actually move. Yeah, but I mean what they would have to do is they, they would have to do, ahead of time they'd have to open up flows out of Gavin's Point Dam for an extended period of time, minimize flows out of Fort Randall Dam so they can draw Lewis and Clark Lake down to an acceptable level a level low enough so that volume-wise, when you have this slug of water now coming from Fort Randall Dam, it creates basically a current in the lake. And, and like, you know, in 2011, you probably saw it, there was a pretty decent current in the lake. 
the debris actually was moving along pretty good. I think the, the lake was turning over volume-wise every 24 hours. So if you draw it down even more, you know, there's going to be more velocity there. And the, and the key is to get it drawn down so there's a low enough volume of water you're dealing with so the velocity stays high enough to keep that uh, sand in suspension as it moves through. Well, I don't think that that's, at least none, not that any of us know, that's, that's not one of the alternatives that's ever been considered there. What, what is the life left in the dam? The well, the, dam, the life left in the dam is different than the life left in the reservoir. I mean, the dam, you can continue to structure itself. They can continue to pump money into to, you know, build it back up stronger. What the, the thing that's, that, you know, we're talking about is the reservoir itself. What's the life of the reservoir? And that has to do with how quickly it fills up with sediment. So, like I showed you, about 150 years out, it would be essentially 100% full. But in reality, the usefulness of it, it, it isn't like it's 100% useful and then drops off to zero 150 years from now. It's just on a steady decline. It's already started declining. And it's a matter of when, when does the usefulness of it, because it's filling with sediment, get to a point that people really say, hey, we've got to stop this and reverse it. And it's kind of, you know, it's, uh, it seems like we're getting there now. I mean, yeah, I'm definitely you're feeling it because it's, your sediment is filling in, you know, back here even more all the time. And you still have to have a way to move that water through, but if all you have is a tiny little channel that's doing it, that's not really your river. So, well, I, we didn't analyze the cross sections into the lake, but they are there and it can be done. Um, one thing I can tell you is that, of course, at the face of the dam, it's pretty deep. Um, but where my photos showed the edge of the delta stopping, that's not really where the edge of the impact stops. So, the, here's the delta sediments you can see, and then they slope off like this into the lake. So if any, any of you guys that have been in a boat coming up to the delta from the lake end, you know that it starts to get pretty shallow well before you hit the stuff that's, that's exposed there. So that's why I'm saying that, it, you know, it doesn't have to, the sediment, visible sediment doesn't have to get all the way to the dam for it to really render the, use, the reservoir useful. And, and it does, and it will impact them. And that's the thing that, you know, that you guys certainly on this end of it are feeling an impact that's different than what they're feeling on the leading edge, but it's actually impacting both sides, both the leading edge and this end are, you know, continue to get worse uh, as time passes on, no doubt about it. Well, so first of all, I, I think that, you know, from a South Dakota and Nebraska standpoint, I think the, the two states would, could come to an agreement on how to handle this because they're both seeing similar benefits and similar impacts. So recreation, fisheries and wildlife, water supply, uh, flooding from rising water levels, that affects both states. And so I, I think they would view it very similarly, similarly and, and come up with, um, you know, probably join forces to try to get something done. Um, all you got to do is pick up the paper on any given day, though, and read about how the downstream states disagree with the upstream states about this. So, I think I haven't seen I haven't seen a lot of talk out of the downstream states about this problem and its potential solutions. But I'll guarantee you, once you talk start talking about messing with flows out of Gavin's Point Dam, the downstream states will perk their ears up. Okay, looks like that's about it. So if anybody has any other questions, I'll be around for a few minutes. But, oh, one more. That I don't know. I, I haven't seen anything that indicates it is really bad. But 
I, I'm not studying the water quality of sediment in Lewis and Clark Lake, so I really can't answer that question. Okay, thanks everybody. Yeah.